He is more than a story. He is more than a comic book superhero. He is more than a symbol of hope. He represents our greatest aspirations. He is everything we think we can be. And yet, even with all the strength and all the power in all of the world, he may not be able to meet his greatest challenges and redeem his family's legacy. For he is the son of El. Chapter 25 Foreign Powers At first, many nations bickered over whether the existence of Starro was a lie or a cover-up created by the Justice League. When Bruce Wayne's company, Wayne Tech, released satellite drone imagery of the incident, it was mostly accepted that a giant headache-inducing starfish from space had caused all of the pain and ensuing mayhem. The nations of the world went immediately back to their war and the existence of the Green Lantern Corps became its own controversy. President Luther questioned what authority the Green Lantern Corps had in coming to Earth. If these Green Lantern think they can police us like some territory, then they have never met an American, because we are not going to take that. The irony of Luther's position struck a dissonant chord with the public. It reminded his voters of his unfulfilled campaign promises. Yet instead of being upset, there was a sentiment in the nation that it was for the better that Luther's promises were empty. The Justice League had truly fought for the world when they needed it most, and both of the Green Lanterns were especially helpful in defeating the star-shaped monster. As the public sentiment shifted, the Justice League's debriefings with Colonel Trevor and Etta Candy increased in frequency and detail. The heroes were eventually asked to return to humanitarian duties. The Polish state of Lubania had seceded from Poland and united itself with Kaznia. Once again, the Justice League was needed to help refugees relocate. The refugees wouldn't be coming from an active war zone, so the whole event seemed a rather mild one for calling in the Justice League. Oliver was suspicious and spoke up about it, as usual. I don't know. It all seems like some PR nonsense. Luther's been looking like a clown lately. He's just trying to score some points by calling us in. Clark had a hard time believing this wasn't some double cross on Luther's part, yet he wanted to keep his personal grudge with Luther out of the matter as much as possible. He agreed with Oliver. If my experience tells me anything, he most likely will try for some photo opportunity. His vanity will have a hard time resisting. When the day finally came, calling the event a photo opportunity would have been an understatement. It was nearly a parade from the moment the Justice League deboarded the Javelin 17. All of them who had fought Starro were there, except for Hal, who had gone away to Oa, and Arthur, who preferred not to be landlocked. John Stewart had returned to Earth and had come along with Black Lightning, the Atom, Nightwing, and Black Canary. Being his first mission with the Justice League, Stewart was thoroughly unimpressed as they posed for their 10th photo session of the morning. When I agreed to return to Earth, I knew it was going to be a downgrade, but this is a joke. Does the Justice League usually get carted around like this? Clark was a bit ashamed that it was his own leadership that had brought them here. Yet he still wanted to give Luther the benefit of the doubt. He leaned in toward Green Lantern to assure him. It's all just formalities. We have to win some faith back from the government. Win faith back? Just how bad did things get? Ah, Stuart, you missed the election last year. It got really ugly. This was all before the big surprise ceremony of the day, where the Justice League met the President of the United States and when Jon Stewart discovered Lex Luthor had won the election. Wasn't he in prison not all that long ago? Yeah, but it wasn't for long enough. Even though Clark had predicted Luther would do something like the surprise encounter, it quietly enraged him. He was happy to have not seen Lex all morning. Luther, on the contrary, appeared delighted to see the Justice League. He acted as though he had not made Superman out to be an alien invader only months ago. Ah yes, here they are, the heroes of the day. I salute you. With a theatrical gesture, the president greeted them like soldiers. Stewart, a former U.S. Marine, was compelled to salute back. This cascaded into several poorly timed salutes from the Justice League. Clark felt awkward doing it, but was glad they didn't have to shake hands. Luther rolled right along with his prepared monologue. What can I say? 
I'm glad you're all on our side, right? <laughs> he gave them his typical deep, confident, and overtly well-timed laugh. Superman took a moment to clarify the Justice League's intent there. We just want to minimize injuries for all sides of the conflict and offer aid to anyone burdened by the cruelties of war. Excellent, yes, agreed, Superman, the cruelties of war. I think that's something we can see eye to eye on. Luther was a consummate performer, as always. Vandal Savage is well named, don't you think? We are here to end his savagery. The Justice League is here to help the people of Lubania in their time of need. Indeed, the freedom of Lubania, the freedom to not succumb to tyranny. Clark found himself perpetually trying to counter Lex's phrasing. Yet as he began to retort, sirens sounded. In a matter of seconds, the U.S. Secret Service ushered President Luther away and his accompanying general informed the Justice League that missiles were incoming. The refugees and all of the day's ceremonies were just outside of the borders of Lubania. Missile turrets a few miles from the border were firing on them. Superman, Wonder Woman, Martian Manhunter, and the new Green Lantern all took flight to confront the attack head-on. The Flash took to the ground. Jon Stewart instinctually took command. His ring enabled him to magnify his voice and direct the group as a tactician. In concert, they brought down the missiles and followed through by destroying the turrets that had launched them. It was a seeming victory. Their heroics were hailed in the American press, yet the Kaznian media told a different story. To them, the Justice League's presence near Lubania was an absolute threat to the budding nation-state. The rest of the world, the nations not affiliated with Kaznia, were divided in their response. Some welcomed the Justice League's involvement, while others feared their presence would severely strain the arms race of superhumans. The Justice League found themselves immersed in the war, whether they liked it or not. Just the idea of them being involved incited Kaznia to use more direct language in their threats and claims of superiority. Vandal Savage was stirring his people into a frenzy, eager to take on the world's superpowers with powers of their own. Even while Kaznia behaved as though they were at war with the Justice League, the Justice League kept themselves removed from any skirmishes that might escalate into full-blown battles. Around the world, where Kaznian allies had access to their weaponry, tensions rose as they concentrated troops at their borders. This weaponry included everything the Justice League had seen during the Kaznian War. Enhanced soldiers, cybernetics, and energy weapons unlike anything the world had yet experienced. When the League gathered at the Hall of Justice to discuss the matter, Superman tried to encourage the team that less was more. Wonder Woman adamantly challenged his thinking. If less is more, then our actions are clear. We go to Kaznia now and end these people from the top down. Start with Savage and work our way through his underlings. Clark could not disagree more. It was crucial the Justice League not ever topple any nation. Besides, from what he knew from Batman, Clark wasn't sure to what extent Vandal Savage was at all mortal. The moment we cross that line, we can't cross back. We're not Earth's judge and jury. You need to understand, Diana. Destabilizing an already suffering country only puts off a bigger problem for another day. I don't think that's preventable. But I do think our Justice League can speed up the process. If the outcome we want is Savage's defeat, then let's defeat him and move on to the next problem. Why wait for this to get any worse than it already has? Doing that will only make matters worse. If we strike first and topple Kaznia, then whatever happens from there will be our responsibility. We'll be thrusting the people of Kaznia into a power vacuum, a vacuum that we would likely have to fill ourselves. Once we do that, we've proven all of Luther's worst fears about us to be justified. Diana's temper was still hot, yet she bit her tongue and put up no other arguments. Black Lightning, though, still felt the need to speak up. Look, I feel like I'm way out of my depth here and ended up at a meeting where a bunch of gods are discussing the fate of the world. And yet compared to Green Arrow, I'm over here shooting lightning out of my hands, so I don't know if I'm the most appropriate one to be saying this. Oliver chimed in to encourage Jefferson. No, no worries, preach on. Well... Well, I totally hear what you're saying, Superman. I hope we don't just wait until the worst has already happened. At some point, we have to take action. These words stuck with Clark in the days that followed. His life had become centered around Kaznia. In his day job, he was covering the conflict for the Daily Planet. During his time as Superman, he attended meetings throughout the week. 
all focused on Kaznia and Vandal Savage. Besides the Justice League's debriefings from Colonel Trevor and the League's own internal meetings, Clark went to the Batcave every few days. Through Batman, there was more to learn, and he could speak more openly than he could at his other meetings. For Bruce's sake, he had to agree not to reveal what he had learned of Vandal Savage to the others. When meeting with Batman, Clark could question him on what he had learned from Colonel Trevor. Batman consistently had another layer of intel Clark could draw from. After a meeting with the colonel discussing a sudden surge in the Kaznian army's ranks, Clark asked Bruce what he knew. Bruce answered in a single word. Orphans. Excuse me? Like us, they're orphans. The soldiers. More like child soldiers. Savage has long recruited children from orphanages under the promise of giving them superpowers. It's on them that he's testing his technology. Clark was appalled. He had once theorized a correlation to superheroes and orphans, but in the light of his theory, this sounded like a sick joke. He did not know what pains these poor children must have endured in Savage's experiments. Clark's meeting with Batman did not last long that evening. He was fueled with a new rage, as well as a sense that he had already failed so many Kaznian children by not taking action sooner. Clark considered if Wonder Woman had been right after all. Leaving the Batcave, Superman did not wait to cool his temper. He flew directly to Kaznia to confront Savage in person. With his incredible speed, he flew into the intensely fortified nation undetected with no opposition. As calmly as though he were walking into another room of his own home, Superman strolled into the Kaznian presidential office. Vandal Savage shone the slightest surprise at his arrival and set down what he was reading. He clearly was not expecting a visit from Superman that day. I never thought I would see the day that the House of El voluntarily entered my abode. And yet here we are. You must be Jor-El's son. Well, boy, what can your uncle do for you? This was not the greeting Clark had prepared himself for. He didn't know what he had expected. His anger had clouded his thoughts as he'd flown over so quickly, and he didn't have time to think it over. He was there because he knew action needed to be taken and yet he knew he was unwilling to go as far as Wonder Woman had suggested. Clark reminded himself of what Jonathan had taught him, and decided it might still be possible for them to find peace through words. It's time we put this war to bed. If you are here to surrender, I have several stipulations. That's not going to happen. Then you might as well try and kill me. I would prefer to get that out of the way. Go ahead, Superman. Break my neck. Throw me into a volcano. I don't care. It would not be the first time a Kryptonian has tried. Can we just talk? I get it. You can't die. But it's not like I'd come here to kill you if you weren't immortal. Savage squinted and took in Superman suspiciously. What's your game, Kryptonian? Is civil discussion now a virtue of your people? Vandal Savage did nothing to hide his contempt for Superman. Clark pursed his lips. He couldn't answer these questions and had no doubt Vandal Savage knew far more about Krypton than he did. How did you know that Jarrell was my father? A smile spread over Savage's face as he paused to relish the moment. I could see you were of the House of El by your chest, my boy, adorned with your family crest. You look very much like your father, though only recently do you appear to be Jarrell's age. I have practically watched you grow up over the years. Clearly you are his son, but you have grown so quickly. I have many questions. Clark looked at Vandal Savage and saw him with fresh eyes. The two of them didn't appear all too different from one another. This was a family matter. Look, let's start over and work this out. My name is Kalel. My father is Jarrell. My mother is Laura. It's good to meet you, Uncle. Clark stepped forward and offered his hand to Vandal Savage as a greeting. This moment triggered a hidden defense system in the room, erecting a sickly green cocoon of energy around Superman, paralyzing him in place. That will be close enough. As I said, I have many questions. So I must inconvenience you with a minor interrogation. Tell me, how many of you survived? It took Clark a moment to realize what was happening. Everything around him had taken on an unfortunate hue just as his body came to a halt. Even his vocal cords were frozen. Listening became difficult. With all of his focus, he managed to hear the last part of Savage's question, yet was incapable of replying. I asked how many of you Kryptonians survived. This question was baffling to Clark. The answer seemed obvious to him, 
yet his efforts to speak were futile. He was completely paralyzed. Vandal Savage sat at his desk, fuming. So you refuse to speak? Fine by me. We can just sit here and wait. I have all of eternity for you to come around. This hollow prism can contain you here like a sculpture in my office until you are ready to talk. Vandal Savage paused for a moment to walk to his bar and pour himself a drink. Returning to his desk, he looked at Superman with an open spite. We really can just wait here forever until you answer a simple question. I don't know why you must be so stubborn about this, but we can wait. This technology holding you captive, it hasn't even been invented yet, but we can wait here until it has been, and even longer than that if you care, or we can be done with this in a few minutes if you will just reasonably answer my questions. So tell me, Kalel, how many of you survived? While Vandal Savage toyed with his captive, unaware of the full degree of his paralysis, Clark struggled to fight through it. When Savage asked his question the third time, Superman managed to make a straining, wheezing sound. Vandal Savage frowned at Superman with an annoyed frustration before pressing a button to open a small control panel at his desk. He scrutinized the display and muttered to himself a moment before turning to the painting displayed behind him. Swinging it away from the wall, he revealed a safe secured by a retinal scan. From the safe, Savage drew out a strange device attached to a headband. Placing it on his head, he sat back at his desk and turned to Superman. Well, this is embarrassing, I must admit. Before you will be able to speak, we will both have to wait here while I ask my future self how to exactly adjust the settings on the Hollow Prism. I hope you can appreciate the lengths I've gone to to undo Krypton. Destroying it is not enough. I will have its power for myself, even if I must reach to the end of time to have it. And that is exactly what I have done, and I will soon do it again. All I need to do is wait for another Nexus in the Nero Matrix to pass. It's a little trick I learned after living for as many millennia as I have. It shouldn't be much longer now. The signal is nearly ready. For the briefest moment, Savage's eyes closed involuntarily and he began to rapidly twitch. He quickly regained himself and began fussing over his control panel, making minor adjustments. After a minute of this, Clark felt the intense pressure all around him lessen until he was able to blink and perhaps even speak. He said nothing, waiting to see what Savage would do next and hoping he might adjust the controls to give him more freedom of movement. When Savage saw him blink, he was satisfied with his adjustments to the hollow prism. So then, as we were, how many Kryptonians survived? Clark still couldn't understand why Savage had any interest in this question. As far as I know, I'm the only one. I'm the only survivor. Tisk tisk. I had not realized you took me for a fool. Am I to believe your Justice League is not made of Kryptonians? Vandal made small adjustments to his control panel with incredibly painful results for Clark. The force that had been paralyzing him began twisting through him, contorting his body with pain. Vandal again adjusted his settings. Do you want to try to answer that question more truthfully? The noose of energy surrounding Clark loosened, allowing him to speak. As far as I know, I'm the only survivor. None of them had ever heard of Krypton before meeting me. The distress in Clark's voice was audible to Vandal Savage. He sat silently staring at Superman with a mix of pity and frustration. If you are this much of a fool, I don't know the point of asking you any more of my questions. It's like tormenting a small child. Run along, Kalel. Go back to your playmates. Probably better you not mention this little failed attempt to anyone. I'll figure out what to do with all of you at a later date. In a single movement, Vandal Savage turned off his kryptonite hollow prism and went back to his reading with a dismissive wave to Superman. Deflated, Clark saw himself out the way he came. Thank you for listening. I'm Isaac Bluefoot. Son of L is written and produced by myself. Tell your friends about this audiobook. 
rate and review it if you haven't already. Every little bit helps. Season 3 of this show just might depend on it. The most significant way to show your support for this show is at patreon.com slash bluefoot. This story was inspired by the Superman and DC Comics and characters originally created by Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster, with additional contributions by Bill Finger, Bob Kane, Gardner Fox, Mike Sikowski, William Moulton Marston, Harry G. Peter, John Broom, Gil Kane, Dennis O'Neill, Neil Adams, Alfred Bester, Martin Nodell, Mort Weisinger, Paul Norris, Joseph Samichson, Joe Serta, George Papp, Tony Isabella, and Trevor Von Eden. Manuscript editing assistance by Trisha Reel. Music in this episode was made by Audio Binger, Blue Dot Sessions, Kevin McLeod, Tortu Supersonic, Spectacular Sound Productions, Poddington Bear, Vortex, David Hillowitz, Kyle Preston, and Dwoogie. See the episode notes for details. For more of my work, Get yourself a deck of Omen Quest cards at omenquestcards.com. Simple games that feel like magic. And be sure to listen to the next episode. Chapter 26. Diplomatic Relations. <laughs>